All right, so we are recording. How you doing today, Will? I'm doing good, Jake. How are you today? I'm doing I'm doing really well. So it's a pleasure to have you on the channel. Um, we've been talking a little bit back and forth for a few a few months now, probably. Um, I think it's like two months, yeah. Yeah, and so I'm I'm excited for for this video. In this video, we're really going to try and get into talking a little bit more about grading um, and your experiences. Uh, in grading both in this hobby and also in right. in other other collectible hobbies um, that you're mm-hmm. that you're quite experienced in, so right. if we could kind of just start with a little bit of your background in the collectible world, where you're coming from, um, your relationship to Pokemon, we'll get into, and then and then we're going to have that that discussion on on uh, which I think will be really helpful for everyone on how you and I think about grading our experiences right. with grading and when we buy graded cards, how we value um, the card and not just the grade. We certainly right. consider the grade and the, and the grade is very important, but, but how the, the card itself is, is, is uh, of, of utmost importance and where we put most, right. most of our focus. So, um, <laughs> so if we, yeah. if we can start ju- uh, just introducing yourself a little bit to, to the people watching the video, uh, who sure you are thing. background in collectibles <laughs> sure thing um hi i'm will um i am a huge pokemon fan have been since i was three years old but i also have been a fan of coins ever since i was maybe six or seven years old just like anyone else you know i got into pokemon with 1999 base set more so jungle in about the year 2000 where the first holog- holographic card i pulled was the cool fable from jungle actually so that's one of my most nostalgic cards, personally. Um, still need the pre-release to play bowl, maybe one day. But, you know, just like everyone, I kind of grew out of it in the mid-2000s, like 2002, 2003. Um, kind of dabbled a little bit in the EX era, collected some of those cards. But what kind of, you know, got me into collectibles in general was when I was about seven or eight years old. My grandma was a real estate agent, and... I was helping her clean out houses that she was trying to sell for other people. And we went in the attic one day of one of those houses and there was a huge bucket of wheat pennies. And I thought it was super interesting because they didn't look like any penny I'd, I'd ever seen. And I was like, why is, why do these look different? She was like, Oh, those are the pennies from when I was a kid. That's pretty cool to see those. And I was like, Hmm, that's weird that she thinks pennies are cool just because it's something from her childhood. That's something you quickly learn that people like things from their childhood. So my uncle actually runs an antique auction in North Carolina. So we called him up and I was like, John, I found all these wheat pennies. I think it's kind of cool. Can you come look at them with me? And that kind of piqued his interest because he's way into coins and he was excited that I was too. So we spent two to three weeks going through like, I think it was 40 to 50,000 pennies, Mm. just like sorting them, putting the dates everywhere, looking for, he taught me, you know, key dates, condition, Mm. everything. So seven, eight years old, I had got my super crash course into finding key dates for coins and condition and sorting them, all the different varieties. Understanding, just like we, we talk about on this channel, understanding the mm -hmm. fundamentals of that market, what, what makes something collectible, valuable, what makes it stand out? Exactly. He kind of let me do it myself. I was like, God, there's a lot of pennies from the 1940s and 50s. Sometimes I'll find one from the 30s, very rarely one from the 1910s and 20s. You know, why is that? And he was like, well, why do you think? I'm just like, maybe they made less of them. And he was like, they made less. They got spent. They got lost over time. You know, he was like the ones that you find from the 1910s. Well, how did they look? And I was like, well, they look all crappy and worn yeah. out. And the ones from the 50s, some of them would be even shiny and red. Uncir- like we call it a mint conditioning cards or um, um, what's the word? Not lightly played. Near mint, mint. Near mint, mint. All these, all these uh, different terms kind of get intermingled. Sometimes they get confused. Yeah. But um, every hobby has its, more- own, has its own uh, I know. terminology <laughs> and, and, and way of discussing uh uh, quality. Yeah. I know. And it seems like you read every single condition ever on any eBay listing these days. Yeah. (laughs) 
but um kind of from them up there on out i did coins with my uncle at the auction for years and years and years and years and i met a ton of people who taught me a ton of stuff about coins you know everything from you know the humble wheat penny to the morgan dollar even to like these more niche bullion coins you know um these are my favorite they're marble marble mm. comics coins okay pretty cool my I think those will be a pretty popular coin hmm. in, the, in the future. But eventually, you know, I would ine- inevitably meet, you know, some graders and some higher up guys at one of the coin grading companies because there's this kid interested in this hobby that's just basically dominated by 50 year old plus men. And they were just kind of like, hey, if you ever want to come down to NGC, which is, you know, a partner of CGC, they're a part of the same company. Um, Just let us know, you know, we could show you whatever you want to see. So kind of just did coins on the side with my uncle for a few more years, you know, got to college, kind of paid attention to Pokemon a little bit when Pokemon Go came out, started watching the like Unless Leafs videos and Lean Hearts videos just to kind of pass the time. Yeah. Because, um, the life of a college athlete can get a little taxing at times. You need to take some time off and watch some Pokemon card videos. And um, I reached, I, you know, all my friends were getting internships one summer after my sophomore year. And I thought, I guess I need to get one too. So I had to get, you know, permission from my football coach to get an internship somewhere. And then I remembered like seven years ago, six years ago, the guys at NGC were like, you know, reach out to us if you want to, you want to grade some coins someday so i texted them they were like yeah sure thing come on down spent the whole summer at ngc grading coins mostly just the modern bullion and it was pretty eye-opening about how the actual grading process is done because maybe people in the card hobby feel this way when you think of psa grading your cards you think of this like super exclusive you know, gated community of these super intelligent guys that know everything and they spend minutes per card just getting every single detail down to the finest detail, just everything. Then you actually go and it's just a bunch of guys at the table and they're like, oh, you play football? You know, tell me about that. Just like looking at coins or at coins the same time they're talking to me. I'm just like, oh, this is more casual than I thought it was going to be. And um, it's just like, uh, I was like, so how much time do I need to spend on each coin? Like a few minutes. They were like, that's crazy. That would cause the biggest backlog ever. You know, just a few seconds for modern on each side and you're good. You'll be able to see everything. Just make sure to, you know, use your loop. You always need one of these if you're going to grade something. Because you can't see every detail if you don't. So I was probably grading anywhere from like a thousand to two thousand coins a day and you know you start to develop an eye for certain things after you look at that many coins every day for an entire summer Hmm. things where you know you can just take a quick look at it and then put it to the side because you know it's either a 69 or a 70 cards that's either a 9 or a 10 Hmm. depending on what grading company you're at because that's just with modern though with the older coins there's a much larger scale because you know these coins have been around for hundreds to thousands of years. For those who don't know, coins are graded on a scale of one to 70, cards are on a scale of one to 10. That's a pretty, pretty wider range than cards. A lot more mar- room for margin of error. So, you know, the mint grades for cards are, you could argue it's eight to 10, but it's really nine to 10 because an eight is technically near mint to mint, but like a true mint card is nine to 10. For coins, it's 60 to 70. That's every single grade for cards, but just for make grades for coins. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot more fine details for the coins than there are for cards. Mm-hmm. However, for the modern coins, 99% of the time, it's either going to be a 69 or a 70, just because the quality is a lot better than it used to be even 10 to 20 years ago. They've gotten it down to a science how to really mint those coins um, 
I think I got one here. Here's a 2020 Silver Eagle. It's actually a pretty collectible year because shortages for everything. You know, they just really, it just looks good. If you look at a silver dollar from 100 years ago, it's going to be off-centered. The strike isn't going to be well. It's going to lost, it will lose a lot of its mint luster, mm. which is things they look at when grading coins. Similar to cards, they've also gotten better. You know, so those modern cards, like you've talked about this a lot, modern cards, people are opening them out of packs, putting them into sleeves. If it was cut perfectly, it's going to be a 10. If it wasn't cut perfectly, it's going to be a nine because no one's going to play with it. It's going to put it in a binder, put it in a sleeve. So those two things are pretty similar when grading cards and coins. But to kind of relate it to modern day, with the current PSA backlog, coins get a backlog every year at the start of the year, January to March. Like I said, with these modern coins, they come out the same time every year, kind of that January to March timeframe. They call it Eagles, Eagle season at PCGS and NGC. PCGS is the same company PSA is a part of. It's, you know, same company is battling it out for all collectibles except for comic books. That's CGC. Um, so there's this debate amongst pretty much every hobby about who's better. So it's not exclusive to cards. This has been going on since the eighties, but they've got it. They've got it really down to a science. You know, they'll get guys in there on Saturdays. They'll get people who normally grade ancient coins or vintage coins or antique coins onto the modern bullion train just crank out those things get in there an hour or two early and just because they have i mean they'll do millions of modern coins during those first three months of the year and they told me that when that first became a thing when grading got super popular in the 90s early 2000s they didn't know what to do because you know it was just a couple old guys before that sending in coins they thought looked cool and then all of a sudden, people are like, oh, these, these modern coins, you know, we can make some money off these. Let's all send them in at once. There are people that will send in anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 of these modern coins at a time. Mm -hmm. That's one person. Mm -hmm. And if you're not ready for that, it's really going to cause a lot of issues. So they had to adapt, and they did. And now, if you look at PSA's backlog compared to PCGS, it's night and day. Their turnaround times have hardly changed at all at PCGS and NGC. I think their bulk service is taking anywhere from two to three months. It hasn't changed. It hasn't changed much at all. And their pricing is relatively the same because they've known how to deal with this. Coin prices have experienced similar price increases this year. Not as much as cards, but they've still gone up. Cards have been whole different story but <clears throat> the PSA is the Beckett's of the world don't even get me started on Beckett they have no idea how to deal with these backlogs but they will they'll learn from this year they'll get better at it just like these coin companies because like you say these hobbies are very cyclical and this is just the first time that Pokemon has experienced something like this and Sure, it might happen again, but it won't be as bad. This will probably be the worst it ever is because like PSA is hiring. I think they're quadrupling their workforce, I think is what I read. Mm. But, but it's for 10 times the amount of input as their output. So basically, when you get down to it, they don't know. They don't know what's going to happen. Like we don't know what's going to happen, but they're going to learn from it. But with that being said, grading right now during this time where they haven't really developed the system that they're going to have permanently going forward, some stuff is going to fall through the cracks, just like it did when coins. They didn't know how to deal with the demand and the supply that was coming in. So, if you look at some of these bulk orders that are coming back from PSA. If you look at them closely, there's some tens 
I got one right here. This is a PSA 10. I'll, I don't know if you can see it, but how off centered that is on the back there. I could just, I don't know how well you could see that, but I looked at that. I was like, it's going to be a nine all day long. Comes back at 10. I was pleasantly surprised because in my opinion, that has no business being a 10. And right next to it, I have a nine that perfectly centered, no white, no print dots, nothing comes back at nine. It's ancient origin blue gif. You must know it's, I was a little upset about that one for a multitude of reasons. Might have to send that one back in, but that's just for me personally. That's a smaller grading order that I use to faster service forge because that's a set I'm trying to complete just because I like it. I like gen three Pokemon that set was made for third generation remakes. So I liked it. I want to complete it all in PSA 10. Yeah. But there's so much going on over there that, you know, maybe those two grades got switched. I, I don't know. Um, For me, there's a, there's sort of a, just a common sense piece, you know, I, cause I feel, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't graded. So I, I'm just getting back my first <laughs> bulk order. Um, from, I just went to stage five. <laughs> from about nine months ago. And I, yeah. so I saw the grades and I'm going to show the grades on this channel. We'll do, we'll do a, you know, one of those PSA videos. Um, but I looked, you know, I'm not going <laughs> yeah, to I'm gonna, no you know, way, for, no way. for me to get my cards back. I'm going to yeah. look immediately. So I, so I looked to see what the grades were and I was surprised. Um, uh, just as you said, there were grades that were surprisingly low. There were grades that were surprisingly high. Um, and you know, it's one small sample size. I'm going to wait to get the cards back to look, to look at the cards, look them over and see how I, how I really feel about it because mm -hmm. it's also, you can miss things, you know, um, you know, little scratches here and there, you know, th this type of stuff. And, um, but I'm definitely looking forward to, to, to looking those over, but I think from a common sense perspective, you know, they're under an incredible amount of stress, you know, let's combine your story, right? Your story where they're already in, in normal times, you know, at this, at this coin company, they're only spending, you know, seconds on, on yeah. cards, right. To, to look at the, look them over, you know, gotta go quick, particularly as you mentioned with, with modern, where maybe the values aren't, aren't as high. So there, maybe there isn't quite as much pressure to, we really right. need to make sure we get this right on this PSA 10 first yeah. edition Charizard, you know, versus, versus a modern card. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, these are not people being paid huge amounts of money and we can, we can go, go in, into that too. These are not people who have been trained extensively. And I'd be interested to hear if you can about your training experience and, and what went sure into thing. that. Um, uh, but just sort of common sense when they're under this amount of pressure with this amount of backlog and they're already even in a normal times, not spending that much time per card, you know, mistakes are likely going to increase. Um, We're all human. So, so exactly. So I, you know, I think that as, as, as um, you know, putting sort of conspiracy theory aside of like any of this is intentional and all these yeah. things in here, right. Just from, just from on a human level, I think as collectors, I think just to think about it on that human level of more mistakes are going to be made. There's going to be more, you know, erratic grading. And so then I think as a, as a collector or buyer of these cards, the next logical question is like, okay, if I accept that reality, <laughs> what do I do <laughs> to, to, you know, to, um, you know, protect myself from not overpaying, you know, on items and or, and or take advantage you know, of, of this, of this time to yeah. maybe, you know, buy cards that are graded nines, but really are tens or buy grades that even yeah. are eights that really are tens, or do you hold yeah. them and then can you cross grade them later or send them back in, in the future when PSA comes down, you know, to try and get that 10. So I think that this is where we go to this idea of buy the card, you know, not the grade. And in this time period, it's going to be more important than ever. Um, because of these, because yeah. of these types of issues. Um, so yeah. So what do you, what's your process when you, when you having this sort of information, when you're looking to buy a PSA card, um, a CGC card, a BGS card, uh, 
how much how much do you are you purely buying the card are you mostly buying the card somewhat buying the grade what what is what is your thought process like i think it's an interesting so so on ebay i would say 90 to 95 percent of the time i buy raw cards very few times have i bought graded cards maybe like i bought a neo destiny toja tick one time just because you know it was just dirt cheap it was at a it was beckett no subgrades eight and a half i was like okay i'm gonna buy the i'm gonna buy the grade here it's it just makes sense i love the card yeah that was you know one in a hundred transactions for me but um i'll type in i won't say what kind of cards i'm buying i don't want to create any frenzy um but i'll type in kind of the set that i'm looking for you know yeah. card hollow whatever set, whatever year, you know, a couple hundred results will pop up. I'll scroll. If it says PSA 10 question mark, don't even look at it. Um, if it says like PSA, CGC, Beckett question mark, I don't look at it because 99 times out of a hundred, that's just someone trying to make a quick buck off of a card. That doesn't look good for anyone that was wondering, but I'll click on the card. It's got two pictures. Most of the time, it's not going to be good. Sometimes though, it could be someone who just made their eBay account. Thanks. I can just take two pictures and it's, and it's good. So I have never not met a message to seller to ask for, can I have X, Y, Z photos? Mm-hmm. Can I have an a front angle, side angle, the side angle, turn the card. I want that angle, that angle, turn it back around. I want close to the four corners and the card. Usually people are pretty considerate and will send that to me. And then I'll evaluate off of those four photos. I don't even look at the back first. I look at the hollow first because I'm a big stickler for, I want my cards in at least an eight, nine grade, sometimes 10 for these vintage cards. But those very few, very, very few tens exist in the vintage hollow market that have not been graded yet. But that's a completely different topic. And a very important so, you know, but yeah. <laughs> and a very important one. <laughs> but um, you know, you know, from nines, people who are scouring, right? You know, we're we're scouring right. as you know the internet as much as possible for for months on end and very tricky to find these these mint cards left. Right. But they're still out there. You know, there's still a lot of eights and nines out there that you can find. And sure. I've been sending some in and grading some. They've been coming back, eights and nines. I have yet to get a 10, so <laughs> still waiting on that. Have you been finding um, first edition Wansi Hollows um, in nines still in the wild? Actually, I've been finding a couple, but it's not, it's pretty infrequent. I graded that one myself. I bought this on eBay. Nice. Well done. It was, you know, they're out there. I got another one sending it in. Um, but I mean, it's one out of every couple hundred cards yeah. that you'll find. And then, got to make sure you don't overpay for it. You got to understand there could very well be something I can't see because photos can only show you so much because what they taught me at NGC with coins is that I'm not going to take out the holder. When you look at the coin this way, it's the coin that it is. If you turn it this way, it's a completely different coin. It shows you a completely different face, completely different flaws because of the different lighting. And if I turned on my overhead light, I would see different flaws. If I use my, I have an overhead light right here. It would show me flaws that that light couldn't show me. Yeah. But this, this one right here, this kind of black light right here, I can see all the minuscule details. This will show me everything. But I can't see that through photos. Scratches on the hollow are the hardest thing to see from an eBay yeah. photo. Yeah, it is when I when I grade uh, yeah. when I grade my cards, I have a whole process where I'm turning the yeah. card, I'm putting it to different lights, I'm taking a break, then coming back later, looking <laughs> at it again <laughs> to make sure and that some, I. Sometimes you'll find stuff that you yeah. didn't know you that you didn't see before, and yeah, like surface, even surface scratches, and and to your point initially, you know, surface scratches destroy can destroy a a very oh, mint yeah. card you know, a few surface scratches. Um, And to your point where you go to the front before you go to the back, um, you know, looking for that surf, those surface scratches first. Right. Cause with coins, 
coins because you know cards you know subgrades there's the centering the surface the edges and um let's say corners just those four everyone knows those four subgrades those are all equally divided in theory with coins the surface makes up like 60 to 70 percent of the coins grade when it's in mint state when it's uncirculated so maybe that's just a personal bias for me because I have such a large background in coins that I value the surface grade so much. But I also think that as this hobby ages and matures, people are going to want those vintage Watsy hollows with really clean surfaces. You know, maybe it's a nine, but it doesn't have any print lines. There's no scratches. It just has maybe a white nick on the back or it's has a, it's a little off center on the back, but the hollow looks clean. Cause for me personally, when I look at my, PSA graded cards, the hollows, there's some nines that have wear on the back and no wear on the front and some that have wear on the front and no wear on the back. And I know which ones I like better. I like the ones with no wear on the front because every card looks the same on the back. What makes it unique is what's on the front. So same with points. To a, a really important topic, which isn't talked about, uh, I think nearly enough in Pokemon because we're such a young hobby, which is eye appeal. Right. And, and this is something that's talked a lot about in older hobbies, where two cards have the same grade, one has a mu is much better looking and has much better right. eye appeal. And so we hear things in Pokemon, you know, where two two where an auction will happen, right? Uh, um, two cards will come up for auction with the same grade, and one might may, may sell a, a decent amount higher, and then people right. think, okay, well. This must have been shill bid or, or this must there, there, you know, it was a timing issue and it's possible that those things are true, but there's also the, I think the more experienced people in our hobby who particularly who have come from other hobbies and understand the effect that I appeal had in other hobbies over time. Understand Shout out to the world. That, yeah. Understand that, that two cards at the same grade are not equal and that w if one has much better eye appeal, and I appeal, I think the tricky thing with I appeal is it can be very subjective. Like someone like very you, subjective. someone like you can be, you know, it's about, uh, you really want a clean surface. You know, someone else may want, you know, centering may be the most important thing because when they see that off-center card, it just drives them crazy. You know, you know, it's- I get that, yeah. Right, you know, so it's, it's there is that, that idea of like what in our hobby is going to be the, um, the- the aspects that appeal to the most of us that create the most value around it is very important. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we know that yet because so many people are just buying the grade. So, so many people, instead of figuring out what is the most appealing to them, and then over time, the market kind of deciding what is the most appealing to everyone. And I think you see that with these swirls as an idea of, you know, Same, I couldn't grade, agree more. You know, it's, it's, People, if they really, you know, and there might be some hype and, and some, some people trying to drive the prices up on those for their own reasons, but, but it goes to this point of there can be, it's eye appeal. There are aspects, we're buying these cards and people will buy them into the future because they're aesthetically pleasing to them because they like to look at them. And so what aspects of, of, of those cards are, are appealing? You know, when we look at sports, right. color is huge. You know, in terms of just the way, like, you know, I, I, I studied a lot of, you know, these fours, fives, sixes, sevens of some of these like old rookie cards. And it's like, right. you know, they're not incorrectly graded even maybe at, you know, the, the, these two fives, but I like this five so much better because the way it looks, right. I have sixes, five, sevens of certain cards. One looks pretty terrible. The other one looks pretty beautiful when I just look at it, you know, just, just right. at it without looking too carefully. So I think I appeals really. So I think the points we've touched on that are really important. One, look out for increased erratic grading during this time period. So, so this is even more important for right now. So that's one. Two, make sure that the cards you're buying are actually graded correctly. <laughs> okay. And then three, um, and take advantage when they're not to your benefit, you know, buy those higher, 100%. I, would, I would look for those, you know, eights or nines that look really amazing and buy, and buy those in terms of that you feel like they're actually should be graded higher. And then three, 
even if the card is graded correctly, think about the eye appeal and think about over time how that's gonna how that's gonna affect prices and appeal to people because it did and has had a significant effect in other markets. And so this is where I preach so much, get outside of the Pokemon bubble and talk to yeah. people who have been collecting a lot longer and have been doing collectibles, antiques, you know, what the things that developed uh, value in those hobbies. Now, are, some of them could be just for those hobbies and pushed by the leaders of those hobbies and gate kept. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's always going to be BS in all of these hobbies. And because people have so much self-interest to push something over another thing in terms of what should be eye appealing and what shouldn't. Right. But there's also going to be just what do people like is going to have a big effect over time. And particularly when you look at 40, 50, 60, 100 years of history in something, I'm a big believer that, that, that the cards that are attractive to people, that people have that innate reaction to, you know, for, for, for a variety of reasons, are going to be the cards that are going are gonna, to um, be able to withstand the hype cycles and people pushing you and telling you to buy something or do something rather than you doing it because that card, that coin, you know, whatever it is, that book, that antique is, is appealing to you and has that appealing element. So, um, so I think another interesting conversation right now is what do you think about the different grading companies, you know, and from your experience grading, and we can kind of go into there next. Um, cause I think that that's really important. Uh, do you, do you, are you concerned with all three grading com companies equally right now? Do you have different feelings about them? Um, so, so I came into cards more heavily in 2019. That's when I really got into Pokemon cards, started buying. I have been kind of looking from the sidelines since about 2016 at Pokemon cards. Don't know why I wasn't buying anything, but probably because I was a college student and had to buy other things. Yeah. But 2019, I actually started buying. Very happy I did just before all the craziness happened that I could actually see what these before prices were. Like I know like a unlimited fossil box was under $1,000 and kick myself every day for thinking that was too much. <laughs> but yeah. kind of when I first got started in coins, it was PCGS or NGC. PCGS is the same parent company, descendant of um, their uh, certified collectibles or collectibles universe, collector's universe. Collector's universe, yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're the same. NGC, CGC, they're part of Certified Collectibles Group. And amongst the coin enthusiasts, PCGS was the, the first one to become established. So they're the first, they're the most trusted just because they're the first one. More coins have been graded there. But NGC wasn't that far behind. They were just a few more years after. They've graded a similar amount of coins. But there's always a premium on the PCGS coins because they were the first. More people have graded with them the older, bigger cats in the hobby grade with PCGS, just like, just like you hear with cards, right? The older, like, even if you're in a, so for us, it's videos, PSA for, for yeah, us, for us that, PSA. The, the equivalent is PSA for us. Exactly. If you watch any of Rusty's videos, he'll say like the PSA 10 is still, that's still the ultimate premium. That is the king of cards, the PSA 10. And it's going to be the I, premium because people are most used to it. It has the most established right. price points, just like for coins, you know, right. You know, for, for any hobby, the, the, the company that grades the most and particularly grades a lot of like the high end cards right. is going to become established as the, as the, you know, and then also they partnered with certain people, yeah. um, you know, certain uh, gatekeepers and people who are, you know, were the, were the influencers of, of the Pokemon hobby and they became right. very close and engaged with those. And so, they they've been sort of there's a mutual sort of loyalty PSA loyal loyal to right. Pokemon and and grading Pokemon and helping the hobby grow by bringing that great those grading services and then these influencers and other people talking up PSA you know grading their own cards grading their own high end cards at PSA 
that sort of thing. And that, that's how these things get, get established in other hobbies too, is, is you know, when exactly. you look at video, you know, uh, um, video game grading and these sorts of things and how those companies were established as a group of collectors and how they, how, right. how they, how these companies try to become and, and become legitimate in the eyes of collectors. Cause all of this is about legitimacy and, and about like, you can trust us and about that the market will pay you more for you sending, you know, you right. sending to us. And so PSA as, as everyone said, has been that has been the, the, I think the comfortable place to send. <laughs> so, right. So do you, how do you, do you feel like, like, let's talk about CGC a little bit. So, okay. so there's, there's a lot of buzz around CGC, right? CGC. Do you feel like CGC from your, you know, just limited experience and in, in sending your mm-hmm. cards, there, grading, do you feel like they're doing a better job right now? Do you feel like because of one, because of their lower wait times and maybe two, because of their training or what they're doing there, um, they're they're doing they're more accurate right now. They're grading tougher. They're not letting as many things slip with their subgrades. You have more of an explanation. It almost forces, I think, the grader to to uh, probably explain exactly and think very kind of focused down on why specifically you know these four categories um, are this way, which gives you that that immediate grade. What what are your feelings about CGC? I personally really like CGC, personally. At first, I was kind of iffy on it because I kind of knew a little bit beforehand they were going to get into Pokemon. I was like, I don't know. It seems like maybe they're buying into the hype, but I think they're doing a really good job, personally. The cards that I've looked at, they've been grading them very difficult. The tens that I've seen, the very few that I've seen, because they're not giving out many tens, which I think is a good thing because there's a huge, huge range of tens that I've seen from PSA. They've been really strict on the nine and a half to 10 grades, which I think is fantastic. And they've made subgrades way more affordable than someone like Beckett, where you're going to wait God knows how long to get your cards back because their platform is ancient, but that's another topic. Um, but the subgrades I think are very good for the current market of these new people that are in the hobby because it shows them, okay, the corners are a 10, the centering's a nine, but the surface is an eight. You know, why is that? Why is this one a 10? Why is this one a nine? Why is this one an eight? Other than just having that overall eight, nine or 10 grade, you're, you think to yourself, okay, this PSA 10, it's a 10, but you know, why does that look like that? Why does that look like that? How did they grade all these things? You don't know because you haven't been involved. I'm not talking about you just in general. You don't know because, you know, you haven't been involved in the hobby very, very much. Um, you could take other tens and look at all of them, but they're all going to look different. With CGC, you get to see the exact sub- subgrades. And from what I've seen, they've been very consistent because, you know, they had to have been ready for this because they saw PSA's backlog, which was already a million cards behind before the pandemic even happened so they had to have known and prepared known that people were going to just going to send keep on sending cards to them keep on sending cards to them their shipping department is insane i can only imagine what psas looks like there's the actual grading building and there's this gigantic four times the size shipping department right next to it you have it's insane to see how many at NGC, how many coins come in and how many go out every day. I, it gives me a headache just thinking about it, how much input and output they have on a day-to-day basis and what their quotas have to be. So they know that. They have known that from their coin department. So they had to have been better prepared than PSA was, who was already backlogged. They had to have known that these PSA-graded cards are going to be pretty inconsistent and it seems like they're holding a pretty high standard on their consistency with their grades, their toughness on the grades. And I personally really like that. And I think these CGC cards that are being sold for less than a PSA card in the same grade, I'm not saying it's a good opportunity, but I'm also saying it's a good opportunity. Not a financial advisor, but if you buy some CGC cards right now, I think you're going to be very happy you did in a few years. 
because I think we're doing a re- really good job. And I don't think people want to admit it yet because they're not comfortable with it. They don't like the idea of this new player coming into the game and creating this decision that they have to make of which one's better than the other when it's the same exact cards. It's just a different label. And the yeah, labels I think, are saying different things. I think it's a complicated mm-hmm. um, subject. And I think it's a bit complicated to predict what will happen because I... I can't think of anything where another, where a new grading company came in, did it so much better and then took over a hobby from another, right. from another company that was so entrenched and had so many of the right. top that's already graded. So I, I think it's unlikely that that's going to happen. I agree um, with that. You know, for, for, for the purposes, one PSA is so, has such strong relationships with some of the biggest names in the hobby already. Um, Two, there are these huge, there are lots and lots of middlemen services, right. That, that people feel really comfortable with and really trust that have been sending and have these, you know, relationships to PSA for a long time. Um, Three, just the amount of cards already graded with PSA for the amount of cards in people's collections that are from PSA, which gives everyone an incentive to hype PSA and not acknowledge as you, as you said, which I think is exactly right, acknowledge the superior um, job that CGC may be doing right now. You know, for me, it's like, because there are so many cards and I only see a certain amount of cards, I can't say CGC is definitely doing a better job than PSA in terms of each individual grade, that Mm -hmm. sort of thing. I hear from lots and lots of people, people that I really trust and respect that CGC is grading harder, that that it's more... um, uh, consistent. Mm-hmm. Um, I take that very seriously. I'm going to wait years before I, <laughs> you know, make some sort of like firm statement on mm-hmm. that. And we also may see it fluctuate. CGC may start getting more, more and more submissions, and then they may start having the same issues as PSA. And then you can get into yeah. questions. Is there, do we need to, you know, replace some of the human element here, you know, or, or yeah. add to some of the human element here for some sort of quality check with, with AI right. in some sense. Um, but, you know, I, I, I do feel at this point that su- things like subgrades, like it's, it's a, to me, unfortunately, I, I actually think that PSA has really done a disservice to this hobby for, for grading so many tens and for being right. so lenient when they started grading Pokemon a long time ago. You see a lot of tens that shouldn't have been tens, right? And then- Some of those low now, serial numbers are bad. Yeah. And then now for the inconsistencies, because it has created an issue where tens could have been actually very rare and much rarer than they are right now. And that would have been better for the entire hobby. I think it would have made everything more valuable. I think it would have made us, I think one of the issues and long-term issues of Pokemon is going to be, you know, in terms of competitive price points compared to sports, comic books, and these sorts of things is how high, how easy it was to get tens in the beginning. I think we're going to be talking about this in 10 to 15, 20 years. Like, I think these are going to be major, major topics about, you know, what do we do with these old tens, you know, um, and these tens that, you know, and I have old tens that are flawless, you know, as well. So I have lots of old, because I tried to buy the card, not the grade as much as I possibly right. could, but I also have buy the grade and, 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 th- and this is, and it's annoying to me, but it's because I don't trust that other people are just going to be buying um, or I buy a card that I think is, is lower, you know, I buy, I crack it and send it back in to get a, get a proper grading because I don't feel confident that this market, at least in the short term is going to, is going to be buying the card and not the grade. And I don't know when that switch is going to happen and I don't know how complete it'll be, but I think the grade is always going to have a certain premium in part because people like the way it looks to have an all 10 set. And because having all 10 sets or all nine sets, it yeah, creates that uniformity, creates that wow factor. And it creates the Instagram follows. It creates the, the social yeah. media follows. It creates the hype around it, which is a big driver of why people collect. They want to show it off and, and have other people say, you have an amazing collection. Yeah. You know, if I show an eight and I say, this is actually a 10, you know, I mean. Who's going to believe you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't, some, you know, some people will look at it and be like, you're right, man. That's an amazing card. You have a 10 there. Yeah. You know, and we may get to a point where that happens more. Um, but 
But yeah, yeah. So I think I think all that's interesting. It's I think my my sort of advice to people is to be thinking about this stuff. Like if if you haven't thought about this stuff before, great. You know, start thinking about it. Start factoring it into your to your purchase decisions. Um, there is no exact percentage of how much I'm buying the card versus buying the grade, but I'm definitely considering it all. And I'm considering what other people are going to want. And then I'm considering how long I'm going to hold an item. The longer I want to hold an item as a collector, the more I care about the card and not the grade, because the more I think that over time, people are going to care more about the card. But if I'm shorter term selling something, you know, you know, looking to move stuff, looking to to, you know, then, then it becomes like, well, what is the market doing right now? And how radically do I think the market is going to shift to that? I think it's going to take a while. Um, I'm interested to see what happens when all of this modern product comes back from these grading companies and how that affects all of this and the, and the discussion around grading. And it'll be interesting to see what the grades are. Do they start grading harder because they can't allow that like so many tens, you know, like it'll be, you know, and that's where we get into yeah. these conspiracy theories is that PSA intentionally suppresses grading on, if you've ever heard that, you know, on like the highest value items to create that value, to create that incentive to grade lots of conspiracies in the sports cards market conspiracies that they, yeah. that they've worked with PWCC to, yeah. to, you know, I don't know if you've heard those things. And Did, didn't SM Pratt have a video on that like a year ago? I'm not sure. I'm not I think, sure. I think you, I think that's where I first heard about it because I wasn't sure if that was a thing. And then I watched his video and made me start thinking like, I mean, it could be true, but I don't think it is. I hope it's not. For me, like the way that I deal with conspiracy theories is I remember them, but, and, and I, but I need a lot of evidence and I take, right. and I, and I look, but I look and I try and seek that evidence and I, and I view it as risk. So for me, Mm -hmm. I'm a mathematical guy. I literally try and put percentages on risk. I say, okay, because I think that that's a credible fear that could really be true, I'm going to put a 5% chance that's true. And then I'm going to put a 5% change in my evaluations of these sorts of things or in my risk, you know, thinking about this risk tolerance that I'm willing to take on certain cards. So that's the way that I handle that stuff. Um, I think not being black and white about these, these types of things and understanding that, that, you know, a lot of these things can also be, um, mistakes, unintended consequences, unintended mistakes, and not necessarily, you know, I think when, when things, when people do like shady looking stuff, a lot of the time they did something bad and shady, but they weren't intending it to be shady. And so it's not something that's going to repeat a lot, or it was one person or, or a few people. So, You have to think very critically about how true do you think this thing is and how is it going to affect the market over time? And you have to look at history. You have to look at what did this do in other markets? There's been, there's been lots of cheating, lots of scandals in so many markets, you know, high end art market, you know, lots of manipulation, lots of craziness, but there's still a humongous high end art market and people are still buying. Do you know what I mean? So so how yeah. much do these things even have an effect and does it matter when you think from that financial perspective? So it's, it's interesting. Um, There's, there, there is one thing that I think people, there's one kind of back and forth I've seen with cards and it's the, are the nine populations higher than they should be argument. I am a subscriber to that because I know from coins, a lot of coin guys that I talk to, some of the most popular, you know, argued grades and coins, it's the almost uncirculated 58 to a uncirculated grade. And it's the mint state 64 to 65. That's where you see the biggest price jumps. And you can't do resubmissions of cracking a coin out and resubmitting it with the higher end coins. Like your, um, like 1895 proof Morgan dollar. That's, you know, that's the granddaddy of the Morgan dollars. If you kept resubmitting that, they would know. They would probably just keep sending it back to you. How would, how would they with, know? Sorry, I, I have a lack of knowledge of, of stuff like that. How would, how would they know? Because it's interesting. You're fine. Because um, after, a, after a coin is graded, I mean, they image it front and back. Um, so they so know it's it looks too like. rare. So they'll have, they'll know, they'll be able to recognize it's the same one because of specifics of, of the card. Right. 
And like I said in the beginning, sorry, someone like <laughs> you're you're fine, you're fine. Someone like me who was new, you know, I was just grading the, you know, the, the modern stuff that was coming in, the stuff I could just look at, you know. There you go, 69, 69, 70, 70, 69, just all day long. The more experienced guys, they do the higher end coins. And they do look at those coins a lot longer. It's because there's not as much coming in because those coins are a lot rarer, a lot more high value. Multiple sets of eyes look at those. You know, they they know. They would recognize it. But, you know, if you do it with the lower end coin, you know, someone like, I'm not going to recognize that. Same with cards, you know, some of the not as rare Neo hollows that have high nine populations. I wouldn't throw it off the table that those have been cracked and resubmitted because you won't oh, yeah. really recognize those. I mean, I the know high, even, like even trophy cards yeah. are, are that's happening too. even, even though oh, you yeah. know, with, with trophy cards, particularly the ones with hollows, you'd think that they'd be mm -hmm. right. There'd be, there's, there's a recognizable sort of hollow pattern. And if the same guys looking at the same card or the same group of guys, someone would, would right. be able to recognize that. But, um, but absolutely. I mean, with, with, um, there's just so much money to be made in recracking because it's because people are, are so buying the grades and not the cards and it's, and there's such an insane difference. I mean, part of that is why I feel like there's a bit of a potential grading mania going on where people are overvaluing what these grades really mean and what, and what these grades actually bring. But then I have this counter argument in my head that say, you know what, even if logically that's completely true, humans don't work that way. We like the tens, we like perfect. And so there's just always going to be this market for paying up a lot for something even if it's the exact same card with the exact same amount of whitening, just because it has that 10, you know? So, you know, just being real with the audience here, I don't know, <laughs> you know, how that, no one how, does. how that's all going to sort yeah. out. I think it's, it's trying to, to be aware of it and think about it. Um, yeah. It's, it's super interesting stuff. Uh, and I, you know, and I definitely feel a, a certain level of anxiety over it because I've, you know, invested so much money, you know, and, and put so much into, into some of these tens, you know, these PSA tens, um, that, uh, you know, I, and I'm very obvious with my, with my, my hope here is that I hope that PSA gets their act together and, and certainly, um, they, they figure out a way to, 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 you know, you know, there's so much, there's so much money on the line here. I mean, I, you know, I have a submission coming back that's worth, you know, 50 to a hundred thousand dollars. Right. And, and it's, and, you know, lots of people are sending in submissions like that because there's so much, there's so much money right now in the market. And, and these were cards I didn't send before because they weren't worth sending in and they're worth that much. These weren't the good cards that I was sending in. These are like the bad cards I'm sending in. Yeah. Like that's the, how crazy the Pokemon card market has moved. You know, I'm sending in, and these are going to sound surprising that these are bad cards, but I'm sending in like, you know, I got a bunch of, P, you know, PSA nine Japanese base uh, Charizard hollows mm -hmm. that th those cards were worth not very much. You know, those have, have unbelievably ballooned. I didn't even send them in. Before. Yeah. Um, but um, the point, the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, with, with getting like these huge submissions, like if all of my grades were one higher or one lower, it would cost me a humongous amount of money. It's a true. So there's, there's a tremendous amount of money and decision-making happening in a few seconds by a person who, you know, isn't being paid that much to do it. You know, they look at their, a thousands every day. What's their training? Like, you know, is their training, you know, and now again, they, I'm sure they have a lot of that experience because hopefully they've been, they've been doing it a bunch and hopefully they, yeah. they do get good and their people are able to do it effectively the training is the experience yeah and i'd love to hear your opinion on that as someone who did the grading in terms of how how effective you think you were in terms of do you feel comfortable were you able to sleep at night being like i because i think about that like if i was yeah. a grader how stressed i would be thinking about it, how much money i'm either giving i'm either you know granting to someone or costing someone and you know all the all those sorts of things but but just from a like a human level, it's just, it's crazy that so much money is on the line on just a subjective momentary opinion in a few seconds, you know, right. 
millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and I just think re- like letting that soak in as a collector and understanding that that's all of the risk about being involved in a marketplace like this is it's so unregulated. It's so easily manipulated and moved around and changed. And um, yeah, but, but please, I- I'd love to hear what your specific experience was um, at, at the, at when, when you were doing the grading do you feel like you were getting the grades right? Do you feel like you improved over time? Would love to hear the ins and outs. Yeah. So when I first got there, I didn't go to the grading room. They started me out as a finalizer, which is like when you get to Q1 in the PSA process, when it's the grades are reviewed a second time for accuracy. That's what I was doing just to kind of get familiarize myself with the grades. And, you know, sometimes I would challenge grades. I'd take it to Mark, who is the president over there. And I'd say, Hey, I think this coin is undergraded. If this kind of went out into the marketplace would make you look bad. And he would look at it. He would either say, no, you're wrong. I think it took me like 10 tries before he agreed with me and like put an X on it. He was like, congratulations. You just cost the company $5. He was like, no, go find, he was like, no, go find another one. And I was like, I don't know. Am I supposed to be happy about this? Uh, <laughs> says it just cost him money. But I did that for like two weeks. Yikes. So that, that, and, and maybe I'm picking up on that too much, but that scares me just that they don't have an incentive to put it back through the grading process because it costs them money. So, so do they have an incentive? So when, when, when you're doing the quality checks, does it cost them money to put it back through grading again? Is that what you're saying? Well, it okay. Cost them money? It's because they have to slab well, it again. Yeah. They got to slab it again. And, you know, given it, it depends on what the type of, because with coins, a lot of the time, you don't see this much with cards, but people, you know, there's an option on a PSA submission where it's like minimum grades. Yeah. Most of the time when people submit Morgan dollars, the minimum grade they want is a 63. Yeah. Because this is a whole nother topic, but almost uncirculated 58s look better than mint state 60 through 62s. Yeah. Because they're uncirculated, but they're man, a lot of scratching on them. They don't look good. An almost uncirculated coin can have no scratches and it will look amazing. It just has a little tiny bit of wear that you can't see. That's why you'll see more AU58 complete sets than Mint State 61s. So this was a grading order with Morgan dollars where the minimum grade was 63s. And one of these Morgan dollars, just the ear, the high spots on coins are what wears first. And this ear had quite a bit of noticeable wear but different grades have different allowances for wear on the ear for Morgan dollars because the dye varieties that they used throughout the years would change. And in particular, the 1986, that dye wasn't as good as the others for whatever reason in New Orleans. And the high grade coins from that year are worth a ton of money, but there is a ton of Mint State 63, 64s and belows, tons. So I was like, this looks too worn, even for this year. That's, and they're like, okay, red dot. We'll just send it back to them, crack it out of the holder and send it back to them in a, in a flip. It didn't meet the minimum grade. That's what that one was. And most of the modern coins, they only want 69s and 70s. If there's a coin that has two to three scratches on it, it just put it in a flip, send it back to them. It's not worth it in a 68 because there's so many modern coins getting graded Mm -hmm. every single almost every single modern silver dollar gets graded if it's not a 69 or a 70 it's it's not worth buying it's just worth its weight in silver which kind of sounds familiar with cards if you think about it it's not worth it if it's not at least nine or a ten modern eights you know how many times do you see those come on the market if it's not a trophy card or like a burning shadow's um, hyper rare Charizard. So like certain cards, it makes sense. But to get back to your original question, after I was a finalizer and got into the grading room, you know, you kind of get some test runs. I got the $50 gold Buffalo bullion coins and you would get a tray of them and you would look at every single one of them, see the seventies from the 69s. They gave me those first because Though that's a very high quality coin. Most of those are going to be 70s. Very few will be 69s. It's kind of the inverse of the silver coins because gold is a gold is a much more malleable metal than silver. 
much more high quality, makes better coins. Always has, always will. That's why you find, that's why the Romans were making their coins out of gold, even though it was a lot more scarce than other metals, just because they could, they could beat it with a hammer better. A little history for anyone who didn't know. And they'd also use a hammer and it was always way off center. They look like crap, but they're cool. Um, but the first time I graded coins, it was what, cause the finalizing is different because the grades already there. You're like, okay, this is this because of that. Okay. That's, that's right. Or that's wrong. When there's no grade there and it's all up to you, to your point, it is a little stressful. You feel a little anxiety because, you know, if I get this wrong, you know, it's going to make, it's going to make the company look bad. And the first time I did it, I got quite a few of them wrong because I, more than one person grades every card or coin just mm -hmm. for accuracy. Once I was done, gave it to the guy next to me, kind of looked at the head grader at the table. He was like, come here. I was like, oh no, I got these wrong. And he like walked over, looked at them and they kind of walked me through why I got which things wrong. And I just kept doing it, kept doing it and kept doing it until I could get it right because if I got it wrong when the second person would catch me, they would not let those go to get slapped because the two graders, at least two graders need to agree on the grade. If they don't, yeah. it goes to a third person. So here's, here's my worry with all this. Thank you for all that, mm -hmm. that, um, no problem. That, that stuff. I think that's phenomenal. Here's my worry going back to specifically, mm -hmm. like, let's think about what's happening at PSA right now. Okay. Right. They have a bunch of new staff where they're trying to hire <laughs> a, a bunch lot. Of staff. So let's, a think, lot about, of let's staff. think about the factors here. So they have a bunch of new staff. Okay. New staff is going to make more mistakes because they're, because as you pointed out, the best way to stop making mistakes is you just do it all day and it almost becomes intuitive. I imagine and automatic, you start looking at cards and it's like, you just know it. Everyone tends to agree. Yep. And I think what you're saying here is that that works, that you feel confident that when, if enough people look at it and then you also have the quality check and if they're seasoned enough people, they're going to come out with the same grade every time or almost the same grade. Mm -hmm. So it's a good right. system. But here's the worry with what might be happening at PSA and where the breakdown might happen if we if we if we uh, put down put down on it before we, before we sort of end today. Um, so new staff, so gonna, they're going to be making more mistakes. Okay, if you have a bunch of new staff making a lot of mistakes, and there's a lot of pressure to keep going and to push things through, and if the if mistakes are made and I think card is graded and it's caught in quality check, it's going to cost the company money to send it back. Are they going to be able to to keep that same standard? And maybe they are. And I'm not going to say I'm not going to sit here and say that I that I know or don't know. But it begs this question of like, like realistically and from your experience, it's like, how do you manage that? And then maybe they are managing it well, and that's why the backlog is you know. And we're just I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Maybe they are managing it well, and that's why there's so much of a backlog. And they're just they're making sure rather than pushing cards out too quickly. They're making sure that they're graded correctly, which I think is is the more important thing. But every time they waste time, agree with that. they're grading less cards. So that's also taking a huge hit because people are starting to send to CGC. So now there's pressure that CGC could be you know, taking some of their market share. So now they have more pressure to get the cards out. So it creates this, this incentive structure where, where they have to balance <laughs> how do we continue to grade effectively and keep our standards because we need to keep our name, you know, uh, uh, well thought, thought, thought after, but if we wait too long, we may lose our market share anyway. So, you know, so what do you do from these PSA standards? And I'd love to be in right. these meetings at PSA to see what their, what their thought processes are. I would love to be a fly on the wall there right now. Exactly. You know, to get more of a sense, but understanding, and I think to, to sort of end the discussion here, you know, and, and try to wrap it up, is, is understanding that all of this is risk for us as someone buying from them. And we don't know how they're handling it. Are they cutting corners? Not because they're, they're, they're a gross company, but because they, they're in an unprecedented, overwhelmed situation. You know, I, I don't have ill feeling. I know a number of people have ill feelings towards PSA. They think they're, they're you know, doing manipulation, all these sorts of things. That's not, I, I don't have any evidence for that personally. I tend to attribute things to human error <laughs> far, far, you know, you have to go with human error first before you go like intentional manipulation or intentional or intentional incompetence. You know, most of the time it's just, 
it's just a degree of incompetence. I have incompetence all the time. We all, all as human beings, we have incompetence because we're human beings. And so that's why you have to set up these systems that help catch that incompetence by having multiple graders look at it, by, by, ha- by having enough time to train everyone, by having the quality checks. But are they really going to be able to hold those same standards when they have so many cards to grade? So I think that, that that's, that's sort of the important point we wanted to make there. Um, uh, it's been great talking to you. I'm sorry to sort of end the conversation here. And we can definitely um, pick up this conversation again you know, on, on the channel, these sorts of things. Um, any last minute, any topics we didn't touch on, if we want to touch on something for 10 minutes here, any last minute thoughts, things that you wanted to bring to today's conversation that we haven't touched on? I just want to make sure that, that, that we, that if there is something we, we touch on it before ending. I would just say, um, if there's any in particular modern cards right now that you want to buy in a PSA 10, there is an extreme premium on those right now, and there will be a lot more of those available in the short to long-term future. I just think everyone needs to be a little bit more patient right now and kind of wait and see how all these things play out. Because like you said, there's a lot of unknowns. This could play out a lot of different ways and we won't know until we know, I think is kind of how it is at the end of the day. So just, you know, think before you act, think before you buy, buy the card, not the grade, try to pre-grade cards yourself. If you want to send them in, write down what you think it's going to be. You're going to be wrong a lot, but sometimes you'll be right and try to get better at it by the ones that you're wrong on. And each time you do it, you'll get a little bit better at it. It's okay to be wrong in this hobby. I think it's another thing a lot of people need to hear. You're going to lose money. Sometimes you're going to be wrong sometimes, but just use those to try to increase your successes, I think is something a lot of people need to hear right now. Yeah. I think that when you're, when you're trying to invest in something, you're always trying to figure out what the average, what the market is doing wrong at any one given time, and then how you can do it better, or you can, you can take advantage of an underpriced item because the market's doing it wrong, or you can take advantage of an overpriced item by selling it because the market is doing it wrong. So I think that if you believe the market is overvaluing, you know, some of the things we talked about here, you know, or undervaluing some of the things we talked about here, how do you employ a strategy and sort of your investing and collecting that takes advantage of that? Um, But it's very difficult to know the answers to these things. And we could be overly fearful of certain things right now. And modern could do better than a lot of us think. Like it is right now. Yeah. And, and exactly. And it could be a long time till it corrects. And um, maybe a lot of the people who are sending tons of these cards in to get graded, they keep most of them and they want them for their permanent collections and they don't come, they don't flood the market. You know, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't, and, and because there's so many people, if you see everyone being afraid, everyone, generally it's a it's it can be there's there can be a really good upside to take a risk i don't see that i i personally i see not nearly enough people realizing that you know particularly in my community we mostly realize it but i go into lots of lots and lots of other right. spaces and they have absolutely no idea in in most of these I, other spaces. yeah they never even i just joined the instagram space yeah. like made a pokemon instagram and yeah started following all these new people to pokemon and yeah. Oh my God. It, yeah. Some it's of the scary. things they say. Yeah. I, so my, wow. my honest interpretation is that there's not nearly enough fear <laughs> about, about these sorts of <laughs> issues that. facing based on being outside of our bubble on this channel where we're mm-hmm. plenty aware, I think mostly of these sorts of things, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, people do, you know, of course, new people get recommended these videos and that's, that's the purpose of yeah. doing this is hopefully someone sees yeah. this and it helps them think critically. But, um, but I think that everyone can be, you can almost getting out of your own, bu- getting out of your network and your bubble is so important because what you're really trying to do is figure out, is the market too afraid or is the market too confident? And when the market is, when people are greedy, you should be afraid. When people are fearful, it's the time to buy and, and, and be greedy and take advantage that people are being irrationally fearful. So I think that um, deciding all that, you know, where, where sort of is the market underestimating overall the effect that the supply is going to have and underestimating the mm-hmm. power of rarity, which is what I, I'm 
putting my bet on that. Or, yeah. or do you feel like, because I'm talking a lot and a lot of people are talking a lot about, about rarity and vintage, and you feel like that's just hype, you want, you want to go the opposite way with it. So um, definitely an interesting discussion that I think, you know, we'll, we'll all continue having. Thank you so much for, for coming on, Will. Um, really appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me. If, uh, you know, I think having someone on that, 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 you know, was a grader that, that saw the ins and outs, you know, of, of how they handle it, you know, in the coin world uh, to give us some, right. some perspective there and have that discussion is, is a lot of value um, for the channel. So thank you so much for, for taking the time to be here with me today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed getting to talk to you finally. Absolutely, man. And, yeah. And, and keep pumping out the content. And I'm going to pick your brain more about coins and, and, uh, um, because I want to get to a point where I feel like I understand, you know, all of these markets decently yeah. well, you know? So yeah. when I first got into cards, my first thought was, dang, there's a lot of similarities with coins. And that's kind of why I was able to get the ball rolling there pretty early because grading was similar and rarity was similar different years different varieties but that that is a really long discussion right there yeah yeah and that could be a whole nother thing we, we talk about in the future I, mm-hmm. I think that that the plea that i would make and maybe you can echo this is learn about other older markets and that that is going to to really help you and i know that it's annoying and i know your passion might be in pokemon and it might not sound fun like looking up these other sorts of things but if you don't if it if you don't want to do that, it almost makes me worried that you're not super passionate or super into like right. the knowledge side and, and educating yourself and understanding all that sort of stuff. And that's completely fine. But then I think mm-hmm. just being aware that you're going to be at that competitive disadvantage if you're thinking about this stuff from a financial perspective and, and, um, and then planning accordingly, you know, not putting so much money on, you know, if you're not doing all that research, right. you don't put tens of $20,000 into something like that, you know, unless you have yeah. the money and you're doing it for fun, then yeah, and away because it's, it's awesome. It's, but. it's generally not a good idea to pile all of your money into the same thing everyone else is. Like in 2010, 2011, I was seeing people pay 90 to $110 for an ungraded silver dollar that just because the price of silver did an unprecedented jump from $20 an ounce to $50 an ounce. Yeah. And they were paying double what it was worth. And a year later, came back down to like $18. Yeah. So just don't buy into the hype. All these collectible worlds are filled with stories like that. Every every person who's been in any collectible hobby for 20, 30 years filled with stories where people lost fortunes on hype. And they were sure about things and they turned out to be completely wrong. So um, that being said you know, you can, you can get, you can become paralyzed by risk and by fear and not take smart calculated risks. I was extreme, you know, like you can be street extremely bullish at times and, and go for it, but then you have to be aware of the risks and you have to mitigate that by putting money in other assets and in other places and by realizing how much you really know about something like, you know, and right. no, be honest with yourself. Yeah. No single person in Pokemon has nearly enough answers to feel, to feel confident. Yeah. I can tell you from, I know them and from talking to them and, yeah. and it's because we, we don't know the supply side is one of the biggest reasons. And also we're in a completely unprecedented period in Pokemon. And we don't know how big this could get before retracing before, before. Right. So the only, the only answer that we have right now is that we won't know until we know. No one knows right now. Yeah. That's kind of the only, that's the only truth I know right now. Yeah. yeah. And if you can't yeah. tell yourself that, I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. And so me, the best answer is history. Be a student of history. Things tend to repeat themselves. What happened in other areas will probably happen here, but right. maybe not, you know, but it will because it just repeats itself in every market for all time. Right. <laughs> but that's a whole other thing. But yeah, um, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. Thank you, Will. Um, uh, have a great rest of your day. Take care. And uh, thank you, you all too. for for watching and 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 tuning in and, and let us know um, what your thoughts are on CGC, PSA, all the grading stuff on on the market in general. We, we look forward to, to reading it. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. Go subscribe to him. 
<laughs> yes, like and subscribe, and <laughs> and uh, you can follow me on Instagram, and and I'm on Clubhouse now, and and the Patreon if you if you want to be involved in that. Oh, and I forgot to say, Will, can they follow you somewhere? And I want to link if you do have an Instagram or you do if people have questions for you, and we could talk about it after too. Yeah, but um, if they I, uh, reach out to you, how how should how would be best? I do have an Instagram. It is of my favorite Pokemon. It's called Tojitic Tycoon. Okay. Um, Tojitic Tycoon. It's like Tojitic underscore Tycoon. That's my like Pokemon Instagram. My okay. like normal Instagram is pretty detached from all that. Um, I just keep that like my personal life and whatnot. Okay. But that's the one where I do all my Pokemon stuff. All right. So we'll, we'll I message that. you on like my personal one. We'll keep the personal one off and I will, and I'll link the, um, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, the Pokemon one to this video. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All righty. Take care. You too, Jake.